So my name is Rick Patua. I'm down here on the southern coast of New South Wales. We took my new boat out for a spin today and, uh, and we filmed it. So the boat is a Carbine uh, uh, 600. It's a six meter center console boat. I really believe that not every boat is the perfect boat for any geographical area. About nine months ago, I moved down to Marimbala. Uh, we launch in a lake. We go down a river, have to go under a bridge and have to go over a bar. So uh, having a center console boat that can do that and, uh, and still operate in shallow water, it's uh, what I was after. One day we might be catching flathead and uh, the following week we might be out uh, catching striped marlin. So uh, I wanted something that could fit all bills and this is a, a really good all-arounder. So my name's Chris, I'm from Port Douglas Marine. I've flown down to Eden to catch up with Rick Batua. This is his Carbine 600 centre console. Rick's fitted out this boat himself and done a fantastic job. I'm really excited to work with him because of his experience in owning many, many deep V trailer boats. He had a lot of input with this build and we're always learning. We're always trying to take as much information on board from our customers and trying to customise the boats to, to meet exactly their, their standards. I know it's not my first boat by far. So I've had about 36 deep V boats. My wife would tell you I'm the biggest boating whore in uh, uh, Australia. And that good thing that I don't get rid of women like I do boats. I went in the Navy to be a Navy diver. Uh, at 17, I was the youngest Navy diver when I went in, and when I got out, I was the most senior and the oldest. And so I stayed in the Navy for 32 years, and every day, pretty much, I operated out of small boats. And uh, they have always been deep Vs. I, I gravitate towards deep V, uh, only probably because that's what I know. Well, just since I've been here in Australia, I've been here uh, about 12 years. I came with a Contender 21 center console, very, very similar to this. Uh, after that, I had an Eden Craft Formula, brand new, custom built for me. And then I shipped it to Cuda Craft. I love Cuda Craft, I'm like family. I've had four Cuda Crafts. I've had uh, two uh, Little Rams, I've had one Cold Front, and I've had one Villain. Probably, although it is bigger and it's in a, it's in a much higher league, I would say the villain in this boat has one thing that's in common that most boat owners uh, uh, would like, and that's the villain is an extremely dry boat, and, and so is this. This boat, uh, um, uh, it is very, very dry, the way they have it uh, set up and the way the balance is. Um, so it's a center console that keeps you dry, and that's what appeals to me. A lot of customers ask me about the ride, how is it, how dry is it, and I guess for a center console, it's hard to say that a center console ever, is ever going to be totally dry, but having now had feedback from Rick, he's had the boat out about a week ago for the first time in 30 knots, and Rick's words were, it is extremely dry, and not just for a center console. So one of the customized options we've done for Rick here, which is becoming more and more popular, is the dive door. Well, the beauty of working with Carbine Marine was uh, that uh, they really went above and beyond. Uh, if you don't know about my story, a couple years ago, I, uh, I suffered a, a horrific shark attack. From that shark attack, I have certain disabilities. I'm missing about half of my thigh and all of my hamstring and my left leg from the shark attack. And uh, Carbine came to the table and said, you know, how can we make a boat that will work for you? And, uh, you know, and what they did really shines through. They built me a dive door so I could get into the boat easier when I dive. And uh, usually getting in a boat um, definitely requires one or two people for me to step into a boat from the dock. Uh, but, you know, when the dive door was open today, I think I just put one, uh, one hand on, uh, on Chris and I stepped into the boat all by myself. And so it does help me getting in, the, in and out of the boat from the pier as well, just as much as it does in the water. Both of us have now owned a, owned a Carbine 600 center console with a dive door. It's, it's a must have feature. You just wouldn't really have a boat without it. I think it, it enhances the usability of the boat and especially for Rick with his disability, we wanted to make sure that we could cater the boat to exactly the requirements he needed. The swim platforms on the back also make it easy for me to get into the boat. So they went above and beyond to help me with that. Uh, starting from up front here, it's, it's got a, a beautiful, large, very large casting deck with three big hatches in it. And one of the, one of the hatches is really uh, an esky. 
So you don't need to have a big esky on the deck because it's built into the casting platform. My particular casting platform has C deck on it, so uh, while you're walking around up there, you, you can grip it very well. Uh, moving back, uh, um, center console, and uh, we have one battery underneath the center console, one battery in, in the back of the boat. Uh, then we have a leaning post, and then right behind the leaning post on the uh, uh, port side, we have our dive door. And um, one of the things that I also opted for was a Bob's machine plate, uh, a hydraulic jack plate. Down here on the south coast of New South Wales, Rick's launching over a lot of different places where crossing shallow bars can become an issue. He finds it easy to be able to jack the engine up and make sure he can cross those bars at speed without worrying about fouling the engine on the bottom or a sandbar. Obviously, the jacking plate enhances the performance of the boat and, and stability. And if you're really looking for the utmost performance and fuel efficiency out of your boat, we can highly recommend that being a way to go. Well, I think you could take a jack plate and put it on just about any boat and they would get better performance out of it. What it's doing is lifting the engine out and finding a sweet spot that has the least amount of drag and the least amount of drag will, will cause your boat to, to perform better, and, uh, but you can only do that with a hydraulic jack plate. Uh, my top speed in the boat right now, the boat's brand new, is about 48 miles an hour at uh, 6,000 RPMs. Well, I love Mercury. My last three boats have all been Mercury's. Uh, um, you know, Mercury's, Mercury's a long time ago were a race boat engine. And when I say that, if, if you've been around boating long, a, a long time, you'll remember that Mercury's had a reputation of loving over 4,000 RPMs, but they had a poor reputation between the 3,000 and 4,000 RPMs. They just did not like to go that speed. And uh, Mercury for sure has got that sorted out uh, and now. And yeah, it doesn't really matter what speed you go over 3,000 RPMs. The engine seems to be happy with it, doesn't struggle. I like the Pro XS's. Uh, they give you a, a bit more horsepower. Yeah, the graphics are nice and it goes well. This particular boat, the six meter or carbine 600 is six meters overall. It's got a 300 mil depth pod. We've got the swim steps fitted on this one and it's got our brand new custom carbon fiber, 500 mil long trim tabs. Uh, we find these custom trim tabs work very, very well on this boat. They're not really there for stabilization as such, but to extend the waterline length of the boat and really give the boat an extra soft ride. Uh, it's 23 degree dead rise, so it's already got a good pedigree. Its length to beam ratio of about three to one uh, gives it that really smooth ride that, that we're looking for up in North Queensland and that what Rick's looking for down here on the, the south coast of New South Wales. In operating a boat in normal conditions, no boat should have to use trim tabs. But if you're gonna put your boat in an extreme circumstance, and go out and try to bust through two meter waves in a 30 knot wind, uh, having a set of trim tabs that can keep the nose down, uh, you know, you want something like that. So uh, when you're hitting the head wind in, in a boat that is a, a small boat, you have to worry about that wind and those seas flipping the boat over backwards. With a set of trim tabs pushing down, they're forcing the bow down, uh, and that, that way, forcing the bow down, it, it gives the, um, the, the, the hull's cutting angle is much sharper and that, that way it's a, it's a much softer ride going through the swell in a head sea with your trim tabs down. I started spearfishing when I was 14 and when I went in the Navy, somewhere in the mid 90s, I got into uh, um, doing blue water spearfishing on flyaway trips. I shot my four mar marlin right here in uh, Australia. I, uh, my first marlin was a blue marlin. The marlin after that was a striped marlin in, off of Bermagui. Uh, then I shot a black marlin in my backyard off of Mission Beach, and I also saw a, uh, uh, a rather large sailfish off of the ribbons. So I got my four uh, billfish down here in Australia. I think they call that a Southern Cross Grand Slam. I've shot yellowfin tuna, bluefin tuna, just about everything that swims, to be honest with you. Uh, diving in the Navy and, and being a hard hat diver or saturation diver, it's quite complex. A lot of gear, a lot of people. You know, to, 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 to do a Navy dive, there's, uh, to do a real Navy dive, there's, there's probably anywhere between 12 or 20 people on station to support you going in the water and doing a mission. And there's a lot of equipment, there's a lot of PMS, there's a lot of maintenance associated with that equipment. Whereas with free diving, it's just you, mass snorkel and fins, 
and holding your breath. Going down, it's very quiet. Um, there's, to me, there's a huge freedom with doing it. And I, you know, love shooting fish. Probably my favorite fish right now to shoot is dog tooth tuna. Um, a lot of people try to shoot them. It's a very, very difficult fish to shoot. It's probably pound for pound, one of the strongest fighting fish in the ocean, and they fight dirty. So the moment you shoot them, they're gonna head for the reef and they're gonna try to bust you off on that reef. Their power is unmatched from any fish. And really, when people ask me about shooting dog tooth, um, it's about 30% skill, 30% equipment, and 40% luck. So uh, I was lucky enough last year uh, in Tahiti to shoot a 72 kilo one, and uh, that's my largest to date. Typically, I am down for about a minute and a half, minute and 45 on the surface for the same amount of time and then go right back down. For this boat, I opted to get a Spitfire. I've had Spitfire trailers in the past. I rather like them. Uh, um, I think it's the only trailer that I've ever known to be anodized. So it's aluminum and it's anodized. And uh, yeah, it's, it is a very, very nice piece of kit. Uh, that trailer is anodized aluminum or 316 stainless steel and nothing more. Everything on that trailer is stainless, including the winch. The beauty of a six meter boat is uh, um, it's, it's, it's easy to operate, it's easy to trailer, and most importantly, it's easy to park. On the finish quality, I mean, I, I've had some amazing boats. Um, I've had Eden Craft, Cuda Craft, Razor Craft, and then I've rebuilt several 17Rs. But the finish work on the carbine is one of the best that I've seen. Uh, their finish work is gorgeous. You'll find no sharp edges. You'll find nothing that is not gel coated. Yeah, it's uh, from the moment you pick it up, there's nothing you really need to do with it. You can buy this boat, boat, motor, trailer, a standard electronics package, ready to go out the door for less than 100 grand. So we built these uh, locally in Port Douglas. Lance at Carbine Marine takes care of the manufacturing of the hull. Us at Port Douglas Marine, we do the majority of the fit out. We can do everything from uh, engine fitting, electronics, navigation, the whole works. Or the customer can come to us and just buy the hull only and take it home and, and do all the fit out themselves. We're very, very flexible in uh, what we can do. We're fully customizable. Everything, console, seats, rod holders, live bait tanks, bait boards, everything is open to customization. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful down here. It's very, very picturesque. Uh, the water was uh, uh, clear, kind of greenish clear, I call it, but uh, you could see the bottom easily in 20, 30 feet. The, the seas are, 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 uh, were really acceptable today. We've got a little bit of a swell, but uh, you know, for a small six meter boat, it did fantastic. Oh yeah, we had all kinds of whales while we were out there, so we, uh, we tried to get as close as we could to the whale, so uh, hopefully we could get a, a tail shot behind the boat. And, uh, but uh, yeah, it was good fun. That's his way of saying, I've got the biggest cock. Yeah. We did have a fish. We went for, uh, uh, I went squid fishing for the first time down here. And I, I think my kids would really like that. So uh, next time I come out, maybe I'll bring them and see if they can catch one as well. And oh, by the way, we ate it. <laughs> so we, we came to this beautiful beach right here. It's kind of secluded. And uh, Travis uh, uh, cooked it up. And uh, yeah, we made wraps out of it. It was delicious. I'm not gonna lie. Do I dive less now after my shark attack? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to learn a, 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 a new spot down here in Southern New South Wales. And uh, you know, I've dove, I think about five times off of Marimbula this year. And uh, you know, I'm aspiring to do more. But do I think about it? Of course I think about it. Okay, so my shark attack occurred just short of three years ago. Myself and a friend were diving off of Brittermark Reef. Uh, we went out to Brittermark Reef in a very small five meter boat. And uh, we started diving the southern end of the reef where we normally dive, but the water was very dirty. There wasn't very many quality fish. So we started moving north on the reef. Every time we moved north, the water became clearer and clearer and clearer until we were on the northern end of the reef and the water had the clarity of vodka. So it was really nice. We shot some fish, but at the first spot on the northern end of the reef, 
um, right off the bat when we hopped in the water, we saw two large bull sharks, which is nothing uncommon in, uh, in, in far north Queensland. When we see a bull shark, we sort of look at the way they're swimming. If they're swimming slow and they're on the bottom, minding their own business, they're not a threat. Um, so we didn't think anything about it. We see it a lot. Um, about the time that we were done with that spot, I turned, and when I turned, I, I got startled because there was a massive uh, fish behind me, but it was a whale shark. So this whale shark was probably 25 feet long, at least eight feet wide, maybe bigger, and uh, it swam all the way up to me. I actually took my spear gun and put it in my left hand and held my hand up like a stopman, and it came all the way up to my hand, and I rubbed its nose, and it let me rub its nose for a while, and then it, it turned around in the left. And uh, so we got in the boat, and we were all laughing, and said, did you get that on your GoPro? And he goes, oh, I think so. And we were just laughing about the fish. I said, oh, we better get going. It's getting rough, and you got a crappy boat. And uh, he said, oh, one more spot, one more spot. It's only 100 yards away. I said, oh, we got plenty of fish, Pete. Let's get going before it gets too rough. And he goes, oh, one more spot, one more spot. So we went to this other spot anchored the boat right on top of it, and it was a balmy that was in the center of about 100 square meters of white sand. I mean, the balmy stuck out like dog balls. You could see it from 100 meters away. And he goes, that's the spot right there. I said, oh, can't miss that. So we pulled up to the balmy and we anchored, got in the water, and there was nice fish everywhere. And so it was my turn to dive first, so I dove and uh, slid on down, and I picked out a nice mangrove jack and click, and the fish was dead. About once the fish was dead, I, I, I swam up to the fish and, and grabbed the, uh, the shaft. And about that time, I saw the bull shark coming up and over the top of the balmy. It was only about two meters from me. Its head was about this wide. And uh, it was going about 100 miles an hour. And uh, I had enough time to smash it in the face. And I rolled to my right. And it sunk its jaws into my thigh, not once but twice. At, at first, when I was punching the, the, the shark's head, um, you could tell after it tried to uh, break my femur, it couldn't break my femur, but I'm willing to bet that it did not like the way I tasted. Because when it turned and it left, you could tell it was scared. It left just as fast as it came. And uh, the first thing in my head was Forrest Gump. And he said, uh, that thing just bit you. <laughs> and then it was Rick's voice in my head. It was like, that fucker just bit me. And uh, about that time, it was as if somebody poured 40 liters of red paint on top of me. And it was, all, I could, it was so dense, I couldn't even see. Uh, and I was like, and then all of a sudden, the, the Navy training kicked in and it said, uh, Rick, get out of the water. So I was down about 11 meters when it bit me. And... Uh, I started swimming up, and as I swam up, um, I could not see from my waist down. There was so much blood, and uh, yeah, so I got to the surface. Once I got to the surface, I crawled in the boat just using my arms, and um, when uh, my dive partner finally got in the boat, I said, three minutes, Pete. I was really calm. He said, three minutes, Pete, and he said, three minutes for what, Rick? I said, you had three minutes to save my life. Uh, take your weights off your weight belt, put it around my upper thigh, and get it as tight as you can. And so I directed my dive partner how to put the first tourniquet on, and, and, it, and it, I knew it wasn't tight enough. And I said, like, it's not tight enough, Pete. He goes, you want me to loosen it up and tighten it up? I said, no, you can't do that now. Take mine off of me and do the same thing. Put it higher and get it really tight. And so when he went and did that, that weight belt broke. So it was all we had was the one ill-fitting uh, weight belt on me. I asked him for my cell phone, because I had a satellite phone. I had a satellite phone. And he threw me my satellite phone. I just, it was already on. It's all I had to do was hit two buttons. And uh, I would look at the cell phone, and it would look clear. And then when I would hit one button, everything would go blurry. And then I put clear. I couldn't, I couldn't push two buttons, and it stayed clear. So I didn't know which two buttons to push. Finally, I threw the, the, um, the phone down. And I said, Pete, just tell Ange. Just tell Ange and the kids, I'm sorry. And he said, sorry for what, Rick? And I said, 
I'm sorry I won't be there for them growing up. Anyways, we started getting going and Pete saw a much larger boat. It was uh, about eight meters, brand new plate boat with a 300 Yamaha in the back. And he goes, I see a bigger boat, should I transfer you? And I knew we were in a crappy five meter boat. And I said, uh, absolutely. So he brought me over to this other boat and he screamed, hey, there's been a shark attack and it's really bad. In that boat, there was three gentlemen. Paul was the boat owner and he was the boat driver. There was a surgeon in the boat that was a, a cardiac um, surgeon. His name was Dr. Ben Reeves. And then uh, they had a friend and his name was Bastion. He's about seven and a half foot tall. He looked like a Yeti, he was so big. Anyways, the doctor dove into water, came into our boat and said, he's in a really bad way, let's transfer him. So they got me into the other boat. I think Bastion did most of that work. And uh, as soon as they put me in that other boat, they put me on my back. And the moment they put me on my back, it was as if an elephant was standing on my chest. And I started screaming, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Uh, one of them pulled out a knife and cut my wetsuit off me. They thought that my, re my wetsuit was restricting me. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And I was, nobody really knew what to do. And I was trying to get away from this immense pain. And when I say immense pain, I've been hurt, hurt, re-hurt in the military, but nothing felt like this. So uh, I, I started wiggling around and I wiggled to my right. And the moment I wiggled to my right, uh, the pain went away. And when the pain went away, then it dawned on me that you're having a heart attack. And uh, I knew, and I've always known, I've ha I have an extremely strong heart. I spent 30 years in the military. I got to work out every day of my life. And uh, I knew that there was nothing wrong with my heart. So it dawned on me, um, the only way you could have a heart attack if you got a good heart is if you've lost too much blood already. And we're only in the first 10 minutes. And uh, so I was on my right side and the pain was not there. And so I was like, you're, you're bleeding to death. So what I did was, is um, I brought my legs up as high as I could and I locked my arms underneath them like this. And I laid on my side thinking that if I brought my legs up, that might pinch off my femoral artery and it would slow down the bleeding. Uh, bleeding. And so I stayed like that for 90 minutes. 90 minutes I bled out in that boat. When I was halfway back, when I was halfway back, they stopped the boat and said, how you doing, Rick? I said, how much further? And he said, we're only halfway there. It was, <laughs> it was as if I was getting an invitation to quit. The sun was like this, it was blue skies. The sun was warm in my face because I was getting cold because I had very little blood left in me. And it felt good. And I knew that if I just let go, everything would be over. But about that time, I started thinking about my kids, especially my youngest kid, who at the time was only seven, and how he would feel about me giving up. And I said, let's just go, 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 go. So, it was a really rough day, even for a, an eight meter boat, and we were crashing through the seas. Every now and then I would open my eyes, I'd see waves going by. I see, uh, you know, the, the puddle of blood in the back of the boat is getting bigger and bigger. And I was like, oh, fuck, just get me there quickly as you can. And then the pounding started becoming less. So I, in my head, I was thinking, we must be going by Sugar Pier uh, because we're getting close to land. And then uh, once the pounding went away and, and, the, and the water was calm, and now he was just giving it everything he could get out of it, I knew that we were near Tea Pier. So I knew three more minutes, three more minutes, four more minutes. Hang in there, Rick, hang in there. And uh, I actually remember lots of screaming and I actually remember him slamming the, uh, the boat in uh, uh, reverse and pulling me up to the pier. Then I passed out. And uh, at the uh, boat ramp, the, once we got to the pier, uh, that was it. Whatever I had was gone. And, uh, I just passed out. But what I didn't know was there must have been 80 to 100 helpers there at the pier. They shut the boat ramp down in Lucinda. They had a helicopter standing, uh, standing by with the helicopter crew and their doctor. Ingham Hospital sent down a, a, a doctor and uh, there was a Dr. Ben Reeves that was on the boat. So there was actually three doctors that were there. 
probably 20 or 30 EMS people, at least a dozen, if not more, fireys and police officers. And they actually had, because we took 90 minutes to get in, they actually had time to put up a tent and everything. So uh, they had a meeting and said, all right, he, they picked the four biggest fireys and said, you're going to get them out of the boat, get them on the stretcher, and get them up here as quickly as you can. Uh, Dr. Ann from uh, Ingham Hospital, your job is to get the cannulars into them, start squeezing blood into them. Uh, Dr. Ben Reeves, you're going to bag them. And the, the doctor on the life flight was going to defibrillate me. And uh, so they, they got me up underneath the, the tent, and they all went to work. It's very, very, very difficult getting a cannula into somebody that has no blood in him. All your veins and arteries, they go flat. But uh, Dr. Ann, she's an amazing doctor, and she got two cannulars into uh, one in each arm, and they started squeezing blood into me. I was hooked up to a defibrillator, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, the doctor on the life flight was going uh, to defibrillate me. I had, at that time, no blood. I had no heartbeat. I had no pulse. So I was completely dead when I got there. And they started squeezing the blood into me, and just before they were ready to defibrillate me, when that blood hit my heart, it kick-started my whole system, and I sat up and said, get off my leg, you're hurting me. And they said I looked like an absolute possessed zombie, and they, zo they, they gave me something and knocked me out, and uh, they, started, they, they went back to work on me. About that time, my wife, Angela, and my closest mate from uh, um, Mission Beach, they arrived at the boat ramp. Um, it, was, it was hard for them to get through the crowd and all the police, but they allowed them to come through. And um, anyway, she was able to give me a kiss before I got on a, um, the, uh, the chopper. They didn't have near enough blood. I lost everything, seven liters. Seven liters is a lot, a lot, a lot of blood. They didn't have near enough blood. And so Dr. Ann gave the, uh, um, the doctor on the life flight saline solution, said when you run out of blood, give them saline. The moment they gave me saline on the uh, chopper, which was about halfway to Townsville, I had a cardiac arrest. Um, my system just didn't like the water that was being introduced into my body. And, uh, and then they had to defibrillate me for sure. So they defibrillated me. And uh, when they got me to the hospital, I was, uh, I was coded code red blanket. Now, I've never heard code red blanket before. The doctor had to explain it to me. He goes, you, you know, you survived a code red blanket. And I was like, what is that? He goes, this is the very worst that could happen to you. He goes, have you heard of code red? I said, yeah, that's a heart thing. Have you heard of code blue? I said, yeah, that's a respiratory thing. He goes, you know why you never hear a code red blanket? I said, no. He goes, because people don't survive. He goes, the fact that you survived a code red blanket, and how old are you? At the time, I think I was 57. He goes, it's nothing short of a miracle. We have no medical reason for you surviving. So, uh, um... I was in a hospital, not very long. They told my wife I'd be in a hospital for 46 months, but my doctor came in one day and she said to me, I said, uh, I'm feeling pretty good today, doc. And she said to me, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I said, what's that? She goes, you can leave when you can walk. Uh, that day I walked with crutches around the entire ward. The next day I walked uh, without crutches, unassisted, a couple times. Two days later, I left the hospital. I actually only spent three and a half weeks in a, a hospital and uh, I survived a shark attack. Good. Good. And what, what, it, what, what limitation did it cause you? What, what it, how did it restrict you? Well, um, my, in the accident itself, I lost my uh, perineal nerve. And so I had no, in the beginning, I had no movement in my left foot. So when I walk, my left foot would just drop down like this. I would drag it and I'd fall over. So they waited about six months and uh, they did surgery on me. They took the tendons and muscles from here. They brought them up to that scar there. They drilled a hole through here and they put them over there by my little toe. And this is me moving my, my foot right now with this muscle. So this muscle is moving my foot up and down. So obviously I, I can no longer do like that. I can't feel my toes. I walk a little bit funny, but to be honest with you, I'm alive and I'm extremely grateful. So this was his top jaw. This is where he grabbed me from, okay? And then this is his back jaw, came up twice. So their top jaw grabs you. The bottom jaw is the jaw, jaw that moves. And then there's a big Y up here as well. So I do walk funny. 
Um, but it's okay, I'm alive. My wife says I'm a much nicer person. Uh, I mean, it puts everything in priority. You know, I, I, I tell people all the time, you know, when I went through my ordeal, and uh, especially that 90 minute period where I was just bleeding out, I never once thought about assets. I never once thought about what I owned. Is all I thought about was my kids and my wife. And that's really what's important. So, you know, if I could leave one message is, think about your priorities in life because it can all be over in a fraction of a second. A fraction of a second, it can be over. So make sure you uh, uh, take notice of what your priorities are and, uh, and value, value your family and your kids above everything else. Well, life under the ocean can kill you in a fraction of a second, I can tell you that. Um, but there's, you know, there's so much beautiful stuff un underwater. Nobody should really focus on the bad that is underwater. Just make sure you, you put yourself in a position and you always have safety in mind. Uh, and, and, and hopefully you won't have something happen to you that happened to me.